This week, we took a special trip up to the State House to chat with the legislators representing our area. That's coming up next on this week's special episode of WNIN Lawmakers. John Gibson, and this is WNIN Lawmakers. As you may know, typically our guests visit us, but this time we visited them. We took a special trip up to the State House to sit down and chat with some of the legislators who represent our area. But first, we started our interview with a very familiar voice, Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting, who covers the legislature for radio stations all across the state. We asked him about this year's abnormally short legislative session and if there was anything that stood out. It's been a very fast session mm -hmm. so far, and it wasn't just me who was thinking that. Uh, the Speaker of the House said in the 34 years that he's been in the legislature, this is one of the fastest sessions he's ever seen. They were moving major pieces of legislation by the end of its first week uh, back in January, which is very unusual. Mm -hmm. They actually have two bills that already went to the governor's desk before the first half even ended. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly unusual. You almost never see that. So yeah, this, this session is flying along so far. Now, is that... Uh is it flying along because we have, in fact, super majorities in one party? Is that what's uh, sort of speeding up the process? No, I mean, we've had super majorities for nearly a decade now uh, right. in both chambers. So I, I actually think it's you can trace it to something a little different this time, which is their calendar was a little truncated, hmm. um, more so than usual. So we're in, we're in a, a, a non-budget writing session, which means it's a short session. Right. Um, so instead of going all the way to the end of April, like they do when they write a budget every other year, uh, they only go to about mid-March. Right. Uh, and that's in, in state law. So um, that is normally they, they have to work at a little bit of a faster sure, pace, sure. but it's actually even tighter this year. Um, because of the way just like the calendar worked out, right. um, they started a few days later in January than they normally do. And they're going to end a few days earlier in March than they have to just because, well, because of some things outside of their control. Yes, as I understand it, uh, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday before uh, going on the air, uh, there, well, there's a basketball situation that's going to actually um, cut the session uh, sh sh potentially short, right? Yeah, it's a very Indiana thing to happen <laughs> that basketball is going to influence when the legislature can adjourn. Uh, the Big Ten uh, tournament is going to be in town, downtown Indianapolis, uh, in, in mid-March. And while statutorily the legislature can go through March 14th, they're going to get kicked out of their hotel rooms, we think, about March 10th for that tournament. Mm -hmm. So that's going to require them to uh, basically uh, vacate the premises, if you will. So uh, the so basketball they're, they're, tournament's going to fill up all the hotels. Exactly, exactly. So they're, they're targeting March 10th, which is not uh, radically unusual. They've encountered situations like this before. But just the way it started and the way it's going to have to end, they have a little less time, almost uh, more than a week uh, less time than they normally do. Well, certainly uh, education has been uh, one of the issues getting a lot of attention. Uh, as you know, thousands of teachers uh, rallied here at the State House last year calling for better pay. But the uh, first bill, as you alluded to, the first bill signed by Governor Holcomb this session was a measure to use nearly $300 million in surplus dollars on uh, college building projects, not teacher pay. Uh, what does that tell us about uh, the gulf between teachers and the state? I mean, is that a pretty adversarial uh, situation? It probably doesn't help the situation any, mm -hmm. um, but, but Republican lawmakers, uh, Republican leaders, and the governor have been very clear for this for months leading into the session, regardless of this, this extra $300 million that they ended up getting from the last budget, which was um, they're not going to put any more teacher pay uh, increases uh, into, uh, into effect before next year's new budget. Now, what they argue is they, they spent um, more than $760 million more million on education in the last budget that passed in 2019. They were hoping that a lot of that would go to teacher pay. We have seen um, some preliminary data that suggests that a lot of school districts, the vast majority of school districts, did increase teacher pay. What we don't know yet is how many teachers actually got salary increases, what were those salary increases like, and so that's data that still has to come in. But I mean, what we know is everybody agrees, even Republicans agree, that 
the work isn't done on trying to increase teacher pay. What Republicans and Democrats and what Republicans and teachers disagreed with uh, this session was, should we do something right now to at least get that started? After that, we were joined by several of our local representatives and talked about what's planned for the second half of this year's legislative session. We interviewed Senator Vanita Becker and representatives Ryan Hatfield and Shane Lindauer. State Senator Becker, thank you so much for coming in this morning. Well, thank you for having me. Excellent to have you with us. Well, uh, the uh, legislative session, this uh, 2020 short session, is uh, just beginning its second half. Uh, what are your priorities as the uh, General Assembly moves into the uh, final month? Well, we want to continue to work on a lot of health care issues, mm -hmm. uh, removing gag clauses so that consumers can actually get rebates that they're entitled to, and also making more information available to them so that they can find out how much a procedure will cost ahead of time so they don't get what we call surprise billing. We get statements after the fact. More transparency. More transparency, more information. That'll, that'll be a real important goal. We've got several health care bills in committee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, one deals with dental hygienists and several other issues. So we'll be working on health care issues, also on education issues. I carried a bill in the Senate, which has passed over in the House, and I. I hope they'll continue to support that, which makes the 15 hours that were imposed on teachers without any debate during the last session, mm -hmm. that make that optional. The governor has come out in favor of making it optional as well. We're also raising the uh, smoking age to 21 and right. the vaping age to 21 and making more penalties for selling to underage children. And and of course, that matches a, a federal that law. That matches right? a federal law, and people say, well, why are you doing that? Well, you know, the feds aren't going to enforce on state property, so we want to be able to enforce it at the state mm -hmm. level Very as good. well as the local level. So, Representative Lindauer, can you tell us, as we are here at the halfway point of uh, this short uh, legislative session, uh, what are your constituents uh, telling you are, are the priorities uh, for District 63? So really, it hasn't changed. Uh, for, for me, uh, you know, we're a small rural area, mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of southern Indiana. And um, really an issue that kept popping up for me starting really going back to last session uh, was particularly farmers dealing with uh, the ability to, to maintain their, their property with, through, through ditch uh, maintenance and things like that, drainage mm -hmm. issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. That, that has been something that I've been working on all year, uh, streamlining the process for, uh, for them to get their permits, mm -hmm. uh, for them to just be able to do what they need to do. And, and so they, they, the, they, being the farmers, have to deal a lot with IDEM or DNR. Of course, on the federal side, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, EPA comes into play there. So really just trying to find a way to streamline the process for yeah. farmers so that they can, uh, uh, <clears throat> again, just do what they need to do uh, without having to, you know, contact three, four different agencies to get an answer that they need. So, so are you seeing more drainage issues? Is that uh, something that's uh, that's been around just recently, or has that always been an issue? Well, I, I guess that depends who you talk, who who you ask. Right. I, I think it's really become a hot button hot button issue, particularly in Dubois County, as far as the farmers go. Um, uh, a lot of times, uh, so DN, if you ask DNR or mm -hmm. IDEM, they'll they'll say these are law, laws that have been on, been on the books for quite some time. Yeah, that's the Department uh, of Natural Resources I'm sorry, and yes, the yes, Indiana I'm sorry. Department Indiana of Department Environmental Department. Management. Mm -hmm. Correct, I'm sorry, yes. So, um, And they don't have a, a police force per se that's driving around looking for violators, but if they see something in the area, then it may yeah. draw more attention to, the, to that area. Yes, and, and that is seems to be what's happened in Dubois County. And so there's been um, just a lot of these issues have popped up in the last year or so uh, that, that it, it, you know, where it's become, become an issue for farmers specifically in Dubois County and, and the, some of the surrounding counties as well. Sure, so. sure. So Representative Hatfield, as a member of the minority party, the Democrats, uh, what do you see as positives so far? Uh, we have done a, a couple of positive things. One, we've done some things on uh, health care transparency, both for 
hospital costs as well as prescription drug costs. We haven't gone far enough. I hope we'll talk a little bit about that, but mm -hmm. we've done some good things on transparency in the healthcare realm. We decoupled uh, the test scores from the school funding formula for uh, the next year. I think that's been a positive uh, step. I'd like to see that uh, be extended out, but the decoupling of funding uh, to allow our teachers and our schools to uh, receive the appropriate amount of funding um, and decoupling it from the test scores has been a positive step as well. Right, right. So, Senator Becker. There was a measure uh, over in the Senate uh, that got uh, some attention, and I believe you voted against it. It was uh, on protections for uh, pregnant workers. But there were some changes made to the, leg to the legislation, as I understand it. Is that what... Uh, what pregnancy, uh, you yeah. Yeah, the pregnancy... Uh, well, that, actually, I voted for the bill. Oh, you did vote for it? I voted for it, and I actually supported it in its original form, which right. would have required that businesses provide uh, accommodations for pregnant women. Sometimes it may just be a chair, it may be a break, it may be a pumping station, which can be a closet that they turn into. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, 27 states have already passed this type of legislation, and I think it, the governor supported it, the State Board of Health supported it. Uh, a lot of the businesses were concerned, but I, I really think that it could have been worked out and I'm disappointed in the fact that uh, it didn't pass but I think that the study committee that the house that was actually amended into the bill in the right. Senate I voted against the amendment to make it a study committee there you go okay I and see. Uh, but it's passed and so now I'm hoping that the House will pass it so that you can actually study it and look at it so that business can be more comfortable with it. Maybe get some of those uh, specifications back yes. in there that were removed? Yeah, that were removed, yeah. exactly. So I think it'll take a summer study this, this summer and maybe we can come back next year and, and try it again. I know the governor is very supportive of it right, too. Right. We will certainly keep an eye on that one. Representative Lindauer. Uh, education funding has been a, a statewide issue uh, and of course in the first half of the session uh, the legislature uh, voted to use a uh, 291 million dollar surplus on uh, college building projects instead of uh, teacher pay raises we chatted about uh, this a little earlier with uh, brandon smith of course there was a big teachers rally up here mm -hmm. uh, last uh, last year why uh, why did the legislature take this route why not use that surplus money on uh, teacher pay so I think if you just go back and look at, at the budget year last year, there, there was a game plan in place by uh, the, the folks uh, in Ways and Means, right, to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going a specific direction. So, so really right now it was, it was just a matter of, um, you know, following the game plan. Um, and, and I think one thing that I've been um, proud of, I think, since, and this, you know, I'm a relatively new legislator, right? I've only mm -hmm. been here for three set. This is my third session. Right. But the legislature that has uh, has done a really good job of, of doing what we ask Hoosier families to do, which is live within its means, stay within a budget, follow and stick to a plan. <clears throat> and I think that they've done a good job of that, uh, of sticking to that plan. And all of a sudden, if you get a, uh, you know, if you or I got a, a big bonus or surplus in our personal household, if, if we would run out and just spend it unexpectedly, would that be the most responsible thing to do? And, and I, I would contend that's probably not the most responsible thing to do. So uh, I think I've been, you know, proud of, of our leadership mm -hmm. and how they've, you know, how they've handled that. Uh, you know, now, now certainly- of course, next year is a budget year. Correct, right, that's uh, where I was going next, yeah. And so can you assure uh, teachers across the state that they will see uh, a, a you know, a boost in pay from the legislature next year? Can I assure them? I'm, I'm new, but I'm not that new, no. Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 would, I can assure you that there'll be some serious discussions about that. Are um, you yourself committed to, uh, to increasing I, I, teacher pay? I, I think that, uh, I think there's a whole lot of issues, you know, a, a lot of uh, aspects that go into that issue. Um, I, I think there's definitely some things that we can look at there. Um, I, I think it's, it's a broad discussion in the sense that some of the numbers that you hear thrown around as far as, you know, we're last, we're last, we're last, according, you know, to certain uh, agencies, mm -hmm. NEA being one of them. Uh, NEA also tracks where we stand, uh, relatively speaking, to cost of living, and we're 22nd. Mm -hmm. 
when you when you throw that into play. Now again, 20 seconds, nothing necessarily to brag about, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not last, yeah, right? right? And you also look at that in comparison to what a <clears throat> excuse me, what an average teacher uh, makes compared to the household, right? right. And household income, median household income. And, and uh, you know, it, it's right it, it's right there as far as a, a, a teacher salary and, and a, what a household uh, income makes. So yeah. there, there's a lot of things at play there. Uh, you know, it's certainly a, a, a broad discussion. Right. I think I'm committed to definitely looking at some of those numbers. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the, the teacher salary is ultimately set by the local school board right. as well. So. Senator Becker, as we move into this uh, second half of the short session, uh, of course, a, a big issue, uh, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, uh, was education. And of course, that uh, education funding uh, that some proposed uh, for that surplus uh, money, nearly $300 million, that, that didn't happen. Uh, so where do we stand right now as far as teacher pay? Is it strictly something that's going to have to wait until next year? Unfortunately, I think it will have to wait until next year. I, I auth actually authored a bill, Senate Bill 354, that didn't get a hearing, hmm. and it would have provided $75 million into schools that didn't get at least the amount of inflation last year. And there were 144 school corporations that weren't even funded to the extent of inflation. And I think that's a real problem. And ever since the state has taken over the funding, the general operating funding, we have not kept up with inflation. And schools are having to do more with less, and it's really stretching. And we're now funding three different systems. We're funding charter schools, we're funding vouchers, and we're for funding regular uh, public, public education, public schools. And the, the voucher program has uh, increased to the extent that now someone making $72,000 with a family of four can have a voucher. Representative Hatfield. Last year, of course, we saw a big rally uh, from uh, teachers and supporters from across the state here at the State House. Uh, but uh, obviously, the first uh, bill that was passed this uh, session, or signed by the governor, rather, um, did away with the idea of using this surplus uh, money, $291 million, for uh, teacher pay. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that was not a positive in your view. No, I was disappointed to see that the Republicans, after promising teachers in the state last year that they would get a pay raise, uh, scrapped that proposal and uh, decided not to fulfill that promise. I have a, a bill that proposes a teacher pay increase for the uh, lowest uh, salaries so that new teachers can come in and make at least $50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. That's just one of many proposals throughout the State House. Both Republicans and Democrats have good ideas on how to raise teacher pay and we ought to move forward on them and do it in a big way that has a meaningful impact for teachers uh, in our districts. You mentioned this uh, $50,000 minimum salary that uh, you're, you're proposing. Uh, does that have much support? Is that something that uh, other legislators find uh, you know, fiscally responsible? Oh, I, I've had a lot of support for it in both caucuses, and I, I think that uh, legislators realize that we have to do something. What I will admit to you is it's, uh, it's not the whole gamut of what needs to be done on teacher pay. It's intended just to assist the new teachers in the state, because what we know is that when teachers leave the profession, by and large, they're leaving in their first three years. And so we've got to do a better job at, at providing a salary that meets not only their abilities and professional skills, uh, but also the job that they're doing in our schools is critical to the future of our economy and our state. And so we've got to treat them as the professionals that they are. My bill is aimed at keeping teachers in the system. We'll need another provision, and I'm hopeful we can work on this in the next uh, session, to increase pay across the board for teachers. Senator Becker, uh, now the uh, Senate uh, voted to allow uh, syringe exchange programs to end in 2021. Uh, did you support that measure? Do you, you feel that's something that needs to be uh, stopped at this point? Uh, I don't think it should be stopped. Uh, there are counties, I think it should be a local decision made by the county commissioners, and that's what it's always been. But un unfortunately, that bill was defeated. Senator Merritt's bill was defeated on the floor of the Senate. Mm -hmm. But I think, unfortunately, the experts say that you don't want bad needles hanging around. So right. 
But again, it's a local decision, a health care issue for some counties, for other counties. They can choose not to decide on. Right, certain. there are only a handful of counties that have, actually have the program That's now, right. right? That's right. Scott, Scott County was one of the very first uh, because they had people dying uh, because of the exchange of needles that they were using. Representative Lindauer. So. All right, well, let's move on to another issue here. Uh, the House uh, just passed a bill uh, that essentially makes it more difficult for utilities to close uh, coal-fired power plants. I believe you've got at least one in your district? Uh, Correct, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So do you think uh, that's a good idea? Should the state be telling utilities they have to keep using coal if they'd rather move to you know, renewables or other energy sources? So this is one I, I uh, really struggle with, to be honest with you, but uh, ultimately I voted for it. I think that it doesn't actually say that they can't do that. It doesn't actually say that they have to continue losing, using coal. It actually le leaves broad discretion to utilities to do whatever they want. If they want to invest in wind or solar or natural gas or whatever, it gives them broad discretion. It really is just trying to get uh, folks to slow down a little bit. And, and look at what the game plan is going to be going for, forward. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really not as <clears throat> broad and sweeping a restriction, I think, as is painted at times. Okay, all right. This is uh, State Representative Shane Lindauer. He's a, a Republican uh, from Jasper. His uh, district represents uh, Du Bois, Davies, Pike, and Martin counties, portions of all of those counties. Uh, Representative Lindauer, we know you're struggling with a cold this yeah, morning, like I many am. Hoosiers yes, are. Yes, yes. We certainly appreciate you chatting Thank with us you. this morning and joining us. Appreciate your time. So, Representative Hatfield. Now, a, a bill to make it more difficult for utilities to close coal-fired power plants. That's a, a bill that got a lot of attention. It's moved forward. Uh, what do you think of it? I mean, should the state be uh, telling utilities they have to keep using coal uh, if they'd rather move toward renewables or other energy sources? You know, this um, bill has had a lot of work on it. It'll have a lot more work on it in the Senate. I um, opposed it in the House in the first round because it, uh, quite frankly, didn't make sense to order or direct the utilities to keep open old plants that have gone their useful life and are now only increasing the bills for ratepayers. Mm -hmm. Utilities are saying it's time to close these down because it, they're driving rates up and the state just stepped in and said, no, we'd rather you keep them open and keep rates high for Hoosiers. And, and so I think we need to look at that proposal. I, I oppose it as it's currently written because I believe that it's a direct increase on the ratepayer. And also uh, environmentalists will say that uh, closing down the coal-fired plants would uh, improve air quality. That's right. And, and I've got a bill that has to do with uh, spill notification for spills into our water streams. And so mm -hmm. across the board, we need to be looking environmentally, making sure that we are keeping our air clean, making sure our water is safe to drink and, and to use. But this bill um, not only will have devastating environmental impacts, it also increases the bill that people pay for their electricity. So, Senator Becker, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that bill? Did you support it? Uh, well, it's a House bill, so I really haven't seen the language yet. It's my understanding, though, that uh, Senator Merritt chairs the Utility Committee in the Senate, and right. he's already said that bill will undergo a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. So. Before I decide, I want to see what the language actually is. I know some folks. Uh, some folks that opponents were calling it essentially a bailout. A for bailout the coal for coal, and um, I, I th really think that businesses should decide for themselves. I don't really think that the state should be involved in it. But we'll see what the language is, right, right, so. and see what they intend to do in the Senate Utility Committee. So you're waiting to see the details yes. on that one, mm -hmm. where, where the devil off the bloom is correct? Absolutely. Yes, indeed. All right. So, Representative Hatfield, you mentioned the prescription drug prices, and the, everyone is affected by that, most everyone. Uh, what, uh, what is your plan, what is your bill, uh, and does it have support? So, I, have, I had an amendment, two amendments last week mm -hmm. on the House floor. One passed, one failed. Uh, and the first one was a proposal that I pulled straight out of the Trump administration. President Trump worked with the governor, uh, Republican governor of Florida, to uh, work both federally and in the state in, in Florida to uh, lower prescription drug prices by importing safe drugs that were deemed safe by the United States uh, from Canada that Canadians pay sometimes uh, 
cents on the dollar compared to what we're paying for the exact same drug. And I got Republican support. I got 16 Republicans, five committee chairs to vote for that proposal. And the leader of the House, Speaker Bosma, unilaterally pulled that off the calendar and killed the bill. I was disappointed to see it because while Republicans are doing some good things in the realm of transparency, what I've said on the House floor is we know what we're paying. Mm -hmm. The pharmacist requires us to pay that bill when we go in to get our medication. And so we want to be transparent. We want to know where all the costs are coming in. But we also need a measure that has a direct impact on the cost of those drugs. And that proposal was aimed to do it. Other states are doing it. Um, it has bipartisan support around the country. The, the President Trump and his administration uh, kicked off the federal uh, um, uh, measures needed to do it. And so I was hopeful uh, that we would move forward on it, and House leadership killed it unilaterally. The other one was uh, had to do with PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers. Mm -hmm. and they are the middlemen between the pharmacist and the drug manufacturers, and they promise to lower drug prices. The problem is, is that all the research is showing that they are coming into the system, taking millions of dollars out of the hands of Hoosiers, and not lowering the price of drugs. And so the uh, amendment to regulate and, and uh, investigate PBMs and how much money they're actually saving Hoosiers uh, failed on the House floor. I was disappointed mm -hmm. to see that, but we'll continue to work to try to have a tangible benefit for Hoosiers as the end consumer. Mm, right, okay, well, we're just about out of time here. This is uh, State Representative Ryan Hadfield of Evansville. Thank you so much for joining us Thank this Thank you, this is fun, I'm glad you're here. Join us next week as we interview State Senator Mark Mesmer and State Representatives Ron Bacon and Wendy McNamara back at our studio. I'm John Gibson. Thanks for watching this special episode of WNIN Lawmakers. <laughs>